Okay, so I've just been told that they've unmuted me, so you can all hear me. Uh, so this is Dr. Atharam, the consultant uh, and nephrologist in Avicenna Hospital uh, and Medical College. Um, so I was uh, just saying that uh, uh, Saturday uh, last lecture is a sort of a blessing in one way that after this year got a Sunday to follow. So no lectures on Sunday. So some of you are, must be listening to me and some of you have switched on your laptops and doing their own things, but uh, that's uh, okay. So I'm not sure that how much neurology you guys have covered in uh, medicine so far. So but what, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, hemorrhagic stroke. So we talk about a bit of stroke and then hemorrhagic stroke. We'll take uh, a case study. Uh, and after that, I uh, will uh, give you some questions, not regarding hemorrhagic stroke, just the medicine questions. And we can see what uh, the answers will could be. I don't know myself the answers. Okay. So 21 years old, a right-handed male with a past medical history of significant for asthma. So a young chap uh, who is right-handed uh, with the past medical asthma. So he was doing some weightlifting. Um, and after that, he went for a shower and uh, he became weak on the left side, he had a urinary incontinence. Um, ambulance was called, patient was rushed to the emergency department. Uh, he was found to have weakness on the left side, but he was following commands. He also complains of severe headaches. So what are the clues in this question is a, a young chap with a previously fit, apart from an asthma, which does, is not a significant comorbidity. Yes, he is not fit and well, but he's got asthma, but he's fit. He was uh, doing some gym training and uh, after that, so gym training means he's doing exertion and he had a headache which was followed by a left-sided weakness and urinary incontinence. Uh, it was an emergency and rightly so, he was uh, taken to uh, a nearby hospital. So, not like, uh, unfortunately, I was in a hospital. Uh, it, it must be hospital somewhere abroad where the patient straight away get a non contrast CT head. Otherwise, patient here sometimes have to wait. But, uh, but uh, however, he was taken to the hospital and a uh, CT uh, NG was done as well uh, after a CT head. So the CT had showed what this, all this white area is a bleed, and this is a edema surrounding the bleed. So, so patient has got an intracranial bleed, which is an acute hemorrhage, and it's a visogenic edema. And if you see, the midline has been shifted as well. So that is the midline, which should be around here, but is shifted. So the diffuse cerebral edema and a midline shift. Uh, a young patient, uh, or most of the times, uh, is caused by hypertension. A so young patient, so rightly so, you do have to do further investigations. You cannot just sit on a CT gram. Okay, he's got a hemorrhagic stroke, and uh, that's okay. Let's uh, 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 deal with it to do a conservative management. He's a young chap, so the, the cause must be somewhere some abnormalities which could be rectified or which could which could be amenable to treatment or, or prevention for further uh, uh, episodes of happening. Okay. So, so far we, uh, we are, uh, so young pale presented after moderate exertion with headache, left-sided weakness, stroke must be ruled out, had a CT scan, showed intracranial hemorrhage, uh, and followed that, he had a CT angiogram, which showed an AV malformation. So these this AV malformations are actually the culprit. Unless you clip this AV malformation, this patient continues to have intracranial hemorrhage. So soon after the presentation, he became lethargic with episodes of bradycardia. Heart rate went down to 30s, uh, uh, but no hypertension. So his areas got uh, uh, 
got compromised as he was subsequently intubated. He was always given mannitol. A mannitol is, is a medication which does a forced diuresis or osmotic diuresis. It, and some anecdotal evidence that it does help in velogenic edema, but uh, uh, this, the evidence is not that strong. So some people do practice, otherwise they, some people don't, uh, doesn't practice this thing. So he was intubated, given medication, and he was moved to neurointensive care unit. So he was a, a, a smoker. There was no family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage or such further AV malformations. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, my ward boy just spilled a hot tea over my lap, so I'm just in a bit distress, uh, but I will continue. So, okay, so he doesn't have any family history of uh, uh, vascular malformation or subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in physical examination before intubation, uh, his blood pressure was stable, his pulse rate was stable, his respiratory rate was stable, his results required some oxygen therapy, and he was sweating. His lungs were clear to auscultation, he is going to a regular heartbeat, uh, modestly distended, uh, no extremity, his dorsal aspidus was positive. So general physical examination and a, a systemic examination is very important to reveal any other risk factors for intracranial bleed, such as some bruise, a uh, carotid bruise, uh, some sort of uh, 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 heart abnormalities or blood pressure abnormalities or aortic aneurysm uh, 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 you can feel on abdominal palpation. So his Glasgow Coma scale was 15 when he came. So let's go through the Glasgow Coma scale. So he opened his eyes to voice, which is E4. So there are four points for eyes. He was oriented to place present. So that scores five. So he had dense uh, left-sided weakness, the left hemiparesis, but if you ask him to move his right side, he is able to move uh, 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 to obey the commands. His motor is six. His speech was fluent. His pupils were equal. He had a left facial droop, and his Babinski was absent. Sometimes the planters uh, uh, can be absent initially. Uh, uh, patients had a facial droop. So patient uh, deteriorated rapidly and needed a ventilator. Urine toxicology, so that's very important because sometimes some recreational drugs can cause intracranial hemorrhages in young patients. Uh, cocaine is, is one of the most notorious medication and fetapines can cause as well. So urine tox screen was negative. So how do you do a rapid assessment of uh, a suspected uh, stroke? So rapid assessment, so there is a scale which is called as a rosier scale. So unilateral facial weakness, you score of plus one. Unilateral grip weakness or arm weakness, plus one, plus one. Unilateral leg weakness, speech loss, visual field, loss of consciousness and seizure scores man negative. So a possible, so you could score from minus two to plus six and a score of zero to above is a possible stroke, is a possible cause.
So our patient had a plus three or plus four, if you calculate this. So he had some facial weakness. He had a leg and arm weakness, a plus three. Speech wasn't lost. Uh, uh, visual field, uh, there was some defect. So our patient was strongly uh, suspicious of stroke. So anything can cause conscious deterioration or can cause neurological symptoms so, apart from stroke. So you must rule out hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia can mimic any condition which can cause deterioration and unconscious level. So exclude hypoglycemia, then you exclude the language deficit. So history and physical examination can, while you are communicating with the patient, will, uh, uh, will indicate a language deficit. Uh, uh, so you can have a receptive dysphagia, check comprehension, uh, ask the patient to name the objects, nominal dysphagia, receptive dysphagia, and articulation check the dysarthria. If the patient can sit up or, uh, or stand without stroke, so you can check the truncal ataxia. So truncal ataxia, hypoglycemia, and language deficit you need to exclude or check for. So motor deficit. So pyramidal signs. So the clumsiness of the finger movements, pronator drift, pyramidal signs, sensory and visual inattention, So you do, uh, uh, sometimes patients are, doesn't, they neglect their right side completely. So you ought to do a, perform a clock drawing test as well. You test sensation and visual fields. One side at one time. <laughs> Sorry, they're just trying to clean the, the, the tea. Okay, so sensory and visual intention we need to rule out by doing a perform clock drawing test, uh, etc. So let's discuss about a uh, functional anatomy. That's very important. So you people do tend to forget about the the arterial supply. So it is it is important in 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 stroke in a way that you can need to assess what territory of vessels are affected. Either it's a hemorrhage or a ischemic stroke. So let's see where we are. Okay. So these are your internal carotid arteries. Okay. This is your middle cerebral artery, and this is your anterior cerebral arteries. So both anterior cerebral arteries are joined with the anterior communicating artery. So internal carotid artery divided into what? Middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery. So the posterior cerebral artery is joined with the internal carotid or the anterior branches with the posterior communicating artery. Then you've got a basilar artery and you've got a vertebral artery. So this area is a circular villus. Then you have your anterior inferior cerebral artery. Sorry. Pontine arteries, we supply the pontine blood. Superior cerebellar artery. 
So they're superior and an inferior cerebral arteries. Then you've got a vertebral artery. It's a very important sort of arterial supply of the brain. So that is very important though. So let's do it in this way. So anterior and middle cerebral arteries supply wire, frontal and parietal lobes. Posterior cerebral artery supply where occipital lobe. Vertebral and basilar arteries supply brain stem, midbrain, and cerebellum. So, anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery supply frontal and parietal lobe. Posterior cerebral artery, occipital lobe. Basilar artery, vertebral artery is the pontine branches. Brain stem, midbrain, and superior and inferior cerebellar are arteries to cerebellum. We'll come to it at the end as well. So, causes of intracerebral hemorrhage and associated risk. So, why intracerebral hemorrhage occurs? So what are the diseases which can cause intracerebral hemorrhage? So some are this complex small vessels disease, wear and tear by aging, high blood pressure, vessel abnormality, high cholesterol, atherosclerosis. So that can cause intracerebral hemorrhage. The risk factors for that is age, hypertension, and high cholesterol. So I would say again, complex small vessel disease with disruption of vessel wall, age, hypertension, and high cholesterol, amyloid angiopathy. So amyloid angiopathy, the causes of amyloid angiopathy are familial, runs in the families, or advanced age can cause amyloid. So amyloid angiopathy means deposits of amyloid in the blood vessels wall, which can cause abnormalities and disruption of the flow. If someone has got a clotting abnormalities or an anticoagulant therapy or has a TPA, which is a thrombolytic therapy, like patients have uh, an MI and has got a TPA therapy and after that, the patient had a cerebral bleed, that is because of impaired blood clotting. A vascular anomaly, like in our patients, AV malformations, Substance abuse, amphetamines, cocaine, alcohol, these all again risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage. So let me talk to you about uh, let me talk to you about again about intracerebral hemorrhage. Small vessel disease with the disruption of the vessel wall. Your risk factors are age, hypertension, and high cholesterol. Amyloid angiopathy with age or familial can cause intracerebral bleed. Impaired blood clotting anticoagulant therapy, thrombolytic therapy, vascular anomaly, AV malformations, cavernous hemangiomas, substance abuse, alcohol, amphetamines, and cocaine. They all are risk factors for intracerebral hemorrhage. So rapid onset of focal deficit of your brain function. So that is the most important thing. So the clinical features includes a rapid onset of the symptoms. So rapid onset of focal deficit of brain function, typical presentation over minutes affects an identical area of the brain depending upon where blood supply is affected, which part of the brain is going to get affected. 
So presenting problems can be weakness, speech disturbance, visual defects, ataxia, headache, seizure, coma, So the presenting problems includes weakness, speech disturbance, visual deficit, visual spatial dysfunction, ataxia, headache, seizure, and conform and coma. So blood test. So blood test can help you to identify the cerebrovascular disease cause. Like you do the clotting, and if the clotting is abnormal, then it means that the bleeding happens because of impaired clotting. You check the cholesterol, and the patient's cholesterol is high, patient is hypertensive, and you know that this is atherosclerosis causing damage to the vessel wall, which can cause intracerebral bleed. Blood glucose to rule out whether this symptoms of weakness, visual indentation, uh, all the symptoms which we have just discussed are not secondary to hypoglycemia. Cholesterol and triglycerides you do, full blood count, CBC, you check for anemia, you check for ESR, some inflammatory disorders can have vas uh, cerebrovascular problems. Genetic test is for a very rare inherited diseases and if you suspect a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you do a lumbar puncture. Let's talk again, uh, about, let's talk again about the investigation. So this is apart from imaging studies. So uh, you do some blood test to identify the cause for the cerebrovascular disease. You check for the clotting, you check for the cholesterol, you check triglyceride, you rule out hypoglycemia, you check for full blood count, ESR for inflammatory disorders and genetic diseases. And if you suspect a subarachnoid hemorrhage, you go for a lumbar puncture, a CT head is normal. Cardiovascular investigations in a suspicion of a stroke, stroke again can, can, can be hemorrhagic or ischemic. You do electrocardiography if some, someone has got atrial fibrillation is, uh, on, is, is a risk for ischemic stroke, but someone with atrial fibrillation and on warfarin and a raised INR can pose the patient to hemorrhagic stroke. Echocardiography to see any thrombus or clot. Neuroimaging, you do a CT scan and you also can do MRI scan. Let's talk about uh, investigations of imaging uh, or imag imaging investigations, cardiovascular investigations. You do electrocardiography and echocardiogram and neuroimaging, you do CT scan and MRI scan. And you can do a further imaging, uh, by a, a further test by doing a CT and geo to actually see where hemorrhage is from. So how you manage the acute score, regardless of ischemic or hemorrhagic. So uh, airway management is very important. And, and, and you do a bedside uh, a swallowing test. You ask the patient to take a sip, and if the patient is able to swallow, then it's safe for swallow. If, it's un if the patient aspirate or has a cough, then the patient is unsafe for the swallow. So you perform a bedside swallow test. So airways come first. And breathing, you can check the patient's the saturation is appropriate. You keep the saturation above 95 persons and make sure the patient is not the kipnic. So, in managing acute stroke, check for airway, breathing, circulation, you check peripheral perfusion, pulse and blood pressure, 
and treat abnormalities with fluid replacements, antiarrhythmic and inotropic drugs as appropriate. So circulation, you check for the peripheral pulses, you check the blood pressure, pulse, pulse pressure, and you treat abnormalities with fluid replacement if patient needs inotropic or antiarrhythmic medications. Hydration status should be important. If there's signs of dehydration, you can give parenterally or nasogastric tube. You pass NG tube to give the fluids or you give IV fluids. So airway, breathing, circulation. Nutrition, you assess nutritional status and provide nutritional supplements if necessary. Just give me one second, please. I'm very sorry about that. There was a, a phone call which I had to attend. Okay, so then uh, the nutritional status is very important. So these patients who have got a hemorrhagic or a, or, or, or a ischemic stroke, they need a lot of nursing care and a lot of effort because their life got changed. They are unconscious or semi-conscious or unable to swallow food. They are unable to walk. They are bedridden. So the necessary uh, nutritional uh, uh, requirements are very much Im uh, of important. So if dysphagia persists for more than 48 hours, start NG feed. Medication, you can give, crush the medication and give uh, NG feed. Blood pressure, unless there's a heart or renal failure, uh, 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 do not lower the blood pressure in the first week as it may reduce the cerebral perfusion because there's an autoregulation, cerebral autoregulation, and you tend not to control or over control the blood pressure for the first week. So blood pressure often returns towards patient's normal level within few first days without the treatment though. Uh, so do not uh, get panic and don't rush. So again, the managing in the acute stroke, we, we, we talk about AOA, we talk about the breathing, we talk about the circulation. Nutrition, nutritional status needs to be assessed. Dysphagia persists 48 hours, start feeding via nasogastric tube. You consider alternate routes for essential medications like NG feed. Regarding the blood pressure control, do not attempt to control the blood pressure unless it's very high uh, in the first few days because blood pressure do return to back to the baseline after a few days. Blood glucose, so check blood glucose and keep it under 200. So there is no panic as long as the blood glucose is less than 200. You do need to avoid hypoglycemia, so you do need to monitor blood glucose levels to avoid hypoglycemia. Temperature, if pyrexic, investigate and treat accordingly. Control with antipyrexis, pyretics as a raised brain temperature may increase infarct volume.
pressure areas, reduce risk of skin breakdown, treat infection, maintain nutrition, provide pressure varying metrics, turn immobile patients regularly. So blood glucose needs to be monitored. Your blood glucose level should be less than 200. You monitor vision closely, glucose levels to avoid hypoglycemia. If patients are pyrexic, you treat the, uh, the pyrexia and investigate it accordingly. Control with antipyretics are raised. Brain temperatures may increase than fork volume, so do not use increased antipyretics. Because the patients are immobile, you do need to reduce the risk of skin breakdown, treat infection, maintain the nutrition, and please provide relieving mattresses to the patient because the pressure a, a, a relieving mattress will help in preventing the bed sores. And you need to turn the posture. I'm not sure if anyone you have look after a, a stroke patient. It's real hard work and it's all about the nursing care. I'll go through the management again in a minute. So bowel habits, you check for urinary retention or constipation, patient may need urinary catheterization or sometimes nemas. Mobilization, avoid bed rest. Early mobilization is, is, is important. Complications of acute stroke, so patients may not die. Complications of acute strokes so are chest infections, epileptic seizures, deep vein thrombosis, painful shoulder, pressure sores, urinary infections, constipation, depression, and anxiety. So these are all complications of stroke, and they all need managing. Because patients are dysphagic, they cannot eat, their swallowing are impaired, they are on NG feed, they get aspiration pneumonitis so frequently, they mean they get chest infections. epileptic seizures because of the increased cerebral edema and cerebral insult, patient may develop seizures. Because they are immobile, they get deep venous thrombosis or they can get pulmonary embolism as well. Pressure sores, shoulder painful because of the urinary catheterization, they can get UTIs, constipation, depression and anxiety. How do you secondary prevent the strokes? A stroke or typical or multiple cerebral TIs, CT brain within 24 hour on site, hemorrhagic, you load the blood pressure but keep the blood pressure more than one third. Some ACE inhibitor, lifestyle modification changes, smoking cessation, lower salt intake, lower fat intake, lower excess alcohol intake, increase exercise, and lose excess weight. So this is a type of a strategy for a, a secondary prevention uh, 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 of, of the stroke. I have omitted the medication part of it uh, uh, in, in the hemorrhagic stroke. So just bear in mind the hemorrhagic stroke can be intracerebral hemorrhage, it can be subacarachnoid hemorrhage, or it can be subdural hemorrhage, uh, depending upon the finding on CT scan, depending upon which type of vessels are involved. Subarachnoid hemorrhage are mostly happens because of abnormalities around the circular villus or there are aneurysmal dilatation already. Subarachnoid hemorrhage are linked with polycystic ovarian 
uh, polycystic kidney disease. Subregular hemorrhage normally presents with headache, which could be worst headache of your life, a throbbing headache, uh, uh, blood pressure may or may not be rise, patient may or may not have any neurofocal neurology, but a CT scan or a lumbar puncture, lumbar puncture shows xanthochromia, uh, and the diagnosis of subregular hemorrhage is, is confirmed, and normally patient does need uh, a, a neurosurgical interventions to decompress or to find out the cause for subregular hemorrhage and prevent for rehappening. Subdural uh, hemorrhage normally happens after the trauma. Uh, 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 people who are taking anticoagulant medications, old age people, they had a fall or a head injury and develop a subdural hematoma or subdural hemorrhage. They, they are normal chronic, they, they, they are normally a chronic acute subdural hematoma. Acute subdural hematoma may have some form of focal neurology, but chronic subdural hematoma can present with just alteration or fluctuation of conscious level or of memories. I will ask them to unmute you. Can you unmute the class? Unmute Kevin. I want them to unmute you. Uh, I will go through this. So we just discussed about the hemorrhagic stroke. We had a case study for the young male. Uh, don't hear you. Properly. If you have any questions, you can ask me question while I go through it. So after moderate exercise, it developed a left-sided weakness uh, and a huge problem. This was taken to the emergency department. He had a CTC. Good. Intracerebral hemorrhage. The CD angiogram showed malformations and clipped. It develops a bradycardia. <clears throat> Go through this. So, uh, 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 bradycardic, lethargic, was compromising, so he was intubated. Before uh, uh, this, he was fine on on, on, exam, on, on presentation. His GCL was 15 by 15, so there was a rapid deterioration. You can interrupt me in between while I go through the slides and ask me questions. The standard examination was uh, sort of uh, almost unremarkable. <laughs> His GC was 15, he was opening eyes to the voice, uh, he was oriented uh, and he had weakness, but his right-sided uh, 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 movement was present. His pupils were 4 millimeter, equal in size and rectilinear left facial drop, 
But that's what we do in a urine toxicology was done. So a rapid assessment of suspected strokes, a rosier scale, so facial weakness, grip weakness, arm weakness, leg weakness, each has a plus one score. Furthermore, speech loss and visual field effects also has got a plus one score with negative scoring with loss of conscious and Caesar, each scoring minus one. So minus two to plus six is total score. Any score of zero or above indicates the stroke is likely. So when you are doing a rapid assessment, you exclude the hypoglycemia, you check for a learning deficit uh, by, by, by having a conversation with the patient, check for a nominal or receptive dysphagia, ask the patient to stand or sit without the post with food to check for the truncal ataxia. The motor deficit is obvious. You check for sensory and visual in intention as well. This is just a functional anatomy of the brain uh, uh, circulation. So this is your internal carotid arteries, which divides into middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, and a posterior cerebral artery. Posterior cerebral arteries joins to by a communicating artery and becomes a basilar artery and a vertebral artery. The basilar artery gives branches to the pontine arteries and the posterior cerebral artery gives branches to the superior cerebellar artery as well and the anterior and inferior cerebral artery and then it joins by the vertebral arteries. So just quickly see, anterior and middle cerebral arteries are frontal and a parietal lobe. Occipital lobe is supplied by a posterior cerebral artery and vertebral and basilar arteries supply the brainstem, midbrain, and cerebellum. So cause and risk factors. Uh, uh, risk factors is always age, hypertension, high cholesterol, AV malformation, clotting disorders, and recreational drugs. Like alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine. Rapid onset focal deficit of brain function, typical presentation over minutes affects an identified area of the brain and is negative and corrected. So presenting uh, uh, so, uh, symptoms could be a weakness, speech disturbances, ataxia, headache, seizure, and coma, due to blood test, lumbar puncture, imaging studies, and how you're managing, going to manage this airway, breathing, and circulation. You manage it to a nursing care. You supply the medications, uh, uh, blood pressure, you check, and control the blood pressure only if there is a heart or a renal failure. Blood pressure of returns to a patient's normal level within a few days. You check the blood colicose. If patient is septic or high temperature, you treat it accordingly. You check for pressure areas maintain the nutrition, providing pressure rest relieving mattresses, turn immobile patients regularly, risk of breakdown, treat the infections, maintain the nutrition. Incontinence is also very common and uh, hemorrhagic stroke, you check for constipation and urinary retention, treat them appropriately. Avoid urinary catheterization unless the patient is in acute urinary retention or incontinence is, is threatening pressure areas. Mobilization, mo get the patients mobile, avoid the bed rest unnecessary. So the complications of acute stroke, just remember the complications of acute stroke. Um, chest infections, patients, because they are NG feed, they can get aspiration pneumonitis and, and, and have chest infections. Epileptic seizures, a deep vein trans thrombosis, Pulmonary embolism, pressure sores, 
urinary infection, constipation, depression and anxiety. So again, keep the blood pressure above. If the blood pressure remains more than 130, 70, after one to two weeks, you can start giving some medication to control the blood pressure. Lifestyle modification is very important. You can lower the fat intake and salt intake to blood the cholesterol and the hypertension. Excess alcohol intake should be avoided. Increase exercise and loss or lose, lose excessive weight. Okay, so here we are done with the hemorrhagic stroke. If you have got any queries, uh, just let me know. Uh, you can ask me questions. I have unmuted you for the last 10 minutes. Uh, okay. Thanks for listening. Thank you.